Howdy. My name is uh, Garrett Sorak. I work for Microsoft. Actually, I work in the uh, Azure Development Experience part of the company uh, in DevDiv, but uh, Rich Turner, who was asked to do this talk, couldn't make it, so I made it my own and I brought it with me. So um, good for me. Yay. <laughs> So today we're going to talk a bit about the Windows console. We're going to look at what's good, what's bad. We're going to look at the new project, Windows Terminal, which I'm sure you guys have all seen, heard, or you know, fell madly in love with and then looked at. Uh, and then we're actually going to talk about a little bit about WSL2, which is the... Hello? You can't hear me. Okay. Now you're going to get the voice. <laughs> so we're going to talk about Windows Terminal, and then I'll go into WSL2. And then we can uh, look and see how you can get involved and, uh, and, and participate in some of the development of this stuff. So uh, let's talk about Windows Terminal. Come on, there we go. OK, first let's take a moment and talk about the difference between the shell and the console. Now, out of all the groups in the world that should understand the difference between the console and the shell, I hope this is it. Um, I, I hem back and forth whether I should even bring this up, but I want to make sure everybody understands that the shell is you know, something like PowerShell, CMD, or WSL, which you know, is, the thing that you, is the program you're talking with. And then there's the console, which is the, the presentation of that on Windows that you're seeing. Um, so on Windows, the shell gets connected to the console by, def by uh, defining the subsystem console and then linking to the console DLL. So that's how that actually happens. And so that provides us with the ability for you know, command line applications, obviously. We'll just let the rest of that go. Okay, so what's not to love about Windows Console right now? I mean, let's face it, you know, its code base predates Windows NT. Uh, a lot of it comes from, from the OS2 days. Anybody here ever use OS2? No? Holy crap! That's actually creepy. <laughs> um, and it was a little antiquated even back then. I think they could have done a, a better job. But unfortunately, we, we, you know, we have it, we need it, we uh, love it. Um, we can't kill it. It's certainly used in far too many places from you know, the Windows uh, installation experience to Xbox. There are, there are a million places where the Windows console is in active use. And yeah, we can't change that. That's just not going to happen. Um, so the question is, you know, can this be fixed? Is this something that we can you know, add all these wonderful features to? Um, and of course, I'm sure you can see where this is all headed in the first place. Uh, so inside the console architecture. So the existing console architecture, we have this, this bit of legacy system that's in there. And uh, I'll have to thank Rich uh, Turner for actually making these slides for me. Um, so you have this, this console host, which is the user experience, the UI, the little black window with the, the, the frame and whatnot. And that thing is run by uh, the console core, and it exposes an API to the application. Yay, great, and everything like that. Uh, and then the command line app is supposed to talk to those APIs. So this is a little bit different. If you're used to the, the way that Unix works or other operating systems, this is not how those ones work. This is basically there's an API that these things talk to and say, oh, I want to put some letters on the screen, blah, blah, blah. They do that fine. Um, now, here's where it gets a little weird, is that there's this actual you know, kernel mode driver which handles some of the communication for part of this. And so the host and the application, which is talking through this console DLL, they end up sending messages back and forth. And it's a little weird and a little bit, what's the word? Uh, it's not something they can easily replace. And this is why the console window itself feels dramatically different than the rest of the windows in Windows operating system. I mean, they can, you know, for a long time, you could, you know, they, they put like all sorts of updates or changes to the way that Windows looked, and that thing didn't really change. So that's kind of where this is has been. And so the, con the, the team that actually adopted the console the, uh, uh, and, and decided to take a look at this stuff, they said, well, I think we can fix some of this stuff. We want to we make some improvements to make this better. And so uh, over the course of the several years that they've been looking at this, they, they have come a long way. You know, even in spite of the fact that it's a 30-year-old piece of code base, um, and it's small and it's fast and efficient. Let's face it, I mean, in Windows NT4, you needed a good eight megabytes of memory to run, and it's pretty much the same code running there as it is today. Well with some tweaks, obviously. Um, but over the last several years, they've added a whole bunch of new features to it. You know, they've added the, the, the transparency, the, the VT, color, uh, the VT uh, escape codes, the 24-bit color, and then they finally actually went and, and, and ripped out enough and stuck in some code in there so that they could actually have a virtualized uh, pseudo terminal. And this is huge because that laid the foundation for the things that are coming, coming next. Um, and they overhauled the innards, and they refactored and modulized this. They took thousands of lines of code and replaced with a lot of modern C++ instead of literally 30-year-old C. Um, and some of the other, you know, they, they went through and they found that there was like, I don't know, 74, 76 or something like this. There was, a, there was a, quite a number of things inside of different parts of Windows that was 
basically bypassing that little kernel driver they have there and saying, oh, I need to tweak this, or I need to change this, or I need this data here, because they wanted to work around this thing. And it was just getting one hack on top of another. So they go through and remove all these things. And so I, I bring this up because a lot of people are like, well, you, need to, you, you can just replace this or whatever. And it's like, so many things were dependent on the behavior of this that they had to go and basically first work out all of those things and, and make these changes. And some of those things had to happen at the kernel level, which is why backporting this stuff you know, to early operating systems is really not an option, unfortunately. OK. So, but everybody, of course, wants more, right? I want a tab terminal. I want um, emojis. I want, you know, UTF-8. I want some configurability, some styling, and, and, you know, frankly, so do we. We have a, I don't know if you know this, but Microsoft has an awful lot of people at, at, at the company who work on Windows. <laughs> Nothing. Holy cow. <laughs> so we all wanted these things. Everybody's been like, yes, we want this too. Everyone's screaming for this. And I think the number of people that were running some sort of third-party console, like Con EMU or Z console or, or one of those other things, it, it was a lot, and everybody's like, you know, this still is a substandard, sub, suboptimal thing. Um, so getting, getting to that point, they, uh, they said, our console, our primary concern is backward compatibility. You know, all these UI changes, they're going to break things. So now they said, we're going to start fresh. So once they were able to actually extract out that behavior and said, here's where we can draw the line. The rest of the YIST system doesn't need to know what we're doing. We can actually make another implementation of the same thing. Yay. And so I'm going to whip through this pretty quickly, because I don't think this is you know, super important, but it is kind of neat to see why it, it, it has to be this way. So a fundamental command line architecture in, in other operating systems looks a little bit like this. You have a, a terminal, you have a command line app, and you got a couple of pipes that connect these things up. And so that works great. And now when you look at, say, uh, blah, 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 come on. And so you can actually stick something in the middle of those pipes and say, can you put this over there? And now we can put this remotely, right? I can connect to a console and go in there. This worked from the beginning of time on Unix, on, on other operating systems. This is just not something they did on Windows. Of course, we realized that. And so they call that little piece in the middle, that the little abstraction, which only has to be a couple of pipes and a little bit of know-how. That's the, the pseudo terminal. Yes, it abstracts the details. Blah, blah, blah. Come on, we don't want to see the demo. Come on. Okay, so then in order to do this on window, with Windows Terminal, the stuff that we're building now, they had to be able to basically make this headless console host that still talked to the APIs that everything is still currently connected with and basically virtualize that infrastructure that it expects to be there. Because we can't obviously go through and change every application that needed that. Um, and then we can turn around and add this PTY or the pseudo console on the outside of it and say, you know, now you can just communicate with the, uh, th this little thing in there. Now, this is a... This is the solution that they've given us. This is the ability to not have to destroy anything, but it already works really well. And so that um, this allows them to put things like a, a better experience inside of Visual Studio Code, um, because now it doesn't have to have all of this other infrastructure for peeking into the console host and doing stuff. It can do things directly. So yada, 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 text over that. And so this looks just like Unix from that side. And from Windows' perspective, it looks just like Windows. So yay, it makes everybody happy, blah, blah, blah. And then, of course, when we add, you know, so this allows us to make a new experience. We have an app now with a Windows terminal, and you end up with, um, boy, it's a lot of animation there, dude. <laughs> so we end up with all these little headless console hosts, which all the programs talk to, and then they can just, you know, reflect their information in the tabs and whatnot. So that works really great. It's a really great idea. I think it's just fantastic. So where does that get us? Oh, time for the demo. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Oh, yeah, let me just... Uh, Come on, come on. There we go. Ta-da. OK, so the Windows console. So here we go. We have a, I, I, here, let me open another one just so you can all see it open. Yay. It's, a very, uh, it's a very nice little app. Um, so in order to get this right now, I went, and, I went and grabbed the source code, and I compiled it up and ran it. It worked great. Um, this thing's really nice, because it has a whole, you know, besides the features like, you know, oh, yeah, tabs. I can add more tabs to the same thing. I can have many, uh, many different kinds of configurations inside of the, the, the console settings itself. So I can say, oh, I want to start an old-fashioned PowerShell, or I want to start a CMD, or I want to start a, you know, uh, an Ubuntu session. So this is great. Switch back and forth. Uh, and, and this is very early code, obviously. This is just, you know, all brand new. They just put, uh, published this very recently. But it is a really nice experience. Um, and it still already has things like, you know, I can do my scaling. You can see the... Well, let's see if we can put something behind that, and you can... Oh, that's one of the weird things right there. Um, and my 
Oh, it's, oh, it is showing it on that screen. It's not showing me the, the blurring, the, the nice little acrylic effect. It's not showing here, but at least it's showing it up there. So you can see what it looks like really nice and whatnot, and you get the, 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 the effects behind it. You know, the scaling works nice. We can have, you know, per tab settings for everything from console colors to the, the, the settings for everything. Um, and again, this does support things like the 30 or the 24 bit, uh, come on, 20. And it's not there. Where is it? Hey, I lost my, uh, my little script for that. I don't know. Anyway, it says support the 24 bit color, um, and all those other things we're looking for. It's really nice because it's, it behaves a lot more like an actual win Windows app when you, you know, you, they resize nicely and the size of the screen inside does change. Um, plus, you know, we have things like Unicode support and UTF-8 support. So, and I saw, I know a lot of people saw this, uh, I was, uh, tweeting about this yesterday. Um, there we go. Right? The, 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 the console, come on. Now that's it. It supports, you know, emojis right in there. So, oh, let me go and grab something from a text window here. Oh, there we are. That one there. So we can grab some things like this and paste. Okay. We can grab, grab some stuff and paste it in. Well, that's interesting. Okay. Well, there are still bugs at this. I am sometimes amazed, but the tab expansion even works. So things like this, you know, these are UTF-8 characters, um, obviously. Uh, and so the console supports these things fairly well. Actually, I think the problem in this might be a little bit of, uh, a, a little bit of a couple of bugs in, in PowerShell itself, because if I do the same thing, uh-oh. <laughs> I made it mad. Okay, well, uh, let's just restart that. Pretend nothing happened. Go back to my WSL in here. All right, and I will go, let's copy that. That works well there, see? So let me make that a little bit bigger on that one. The great part about that, you know, and this one here, you know, and it, you know, it, it works pretty good. I'm actually pretty impressed with the way this works. So this allows us to actually expand what we see, what we, uh, and, and the experience that we're seeing on the Windows console. Um, I'm, I'm pretty happy with it. It's still, it is still a little rough, and they're going to be working towards uh, getting some of this stuff going. Let me uh, jump back. Sorry? Let me jump back to my deck here. We can talk about some of the things that are actually inside of this. Yay. Okay, so what are we actually looking for in this new terminal experience? Well, um, they want to, you know, obviously things like the tabs and the, you know, copy and paste experience and all that sort of stuff. The background transparency and blur. Uh, they're basically looking to make this as a, as a convenient and, and comfortable working environment for command line, uh, command line work as they possibly can. Um, it's already got great support for uh, customization through color themes and styles, and I can, you know, show you the configuration for that. Somebody laugh. <laughs> um, and they want to be able to add things like connectivity to lo remote and local shells. So this gives us this ability to say, oh, I've got a machine over there. I just want to connect to the console and do something with that, which is actually a huge difference for the way my, uh, you know, Windows typically works. Um, and this should actually provide us with an awful lot of useful things. The beautiful text. They've, so, so the existing console shell, the console host in Windows, um, it uses a, a very old technology, GDI, for actually writing all this stuff to the screen and stuff like that. And so there's an awful lot of limitations on what you can actually put in that window uh, and the quality of the fonts that get in there and uh, support for UTF-8 and stuff like that. There's a lot of little things that make it very difficult to do anything uh, with that. And so they completely wrote a whole new engine for using direct write, and it's all very fast and, and snappy. Actually, they had to do quite a lot of work underneath the covers in order to be able to add in things like, you know, monospaced fonts in, a, uh, in, their, in their thing to come out quite right. Anyway, they added all that stuff in there. They went to UTF-8 emoji programming ligatures. Uh, I know a lot of people like to use uh, the ligature fonts that give you the you know, for, for greater than equals, it puts a little thing with a line under it. Um, so this is becoming uh, very regularly to the Microsoft Store. They expect this should be summer of 2019 is when they're saying the first prototype is, uh, is going to be in there. Um, and after that, it will actually deliver regularly every couple of weeks, I think is what they're saying. Um, and so they're hoping to have this thing, you know, in 1.0 quality by the, end of, uh, by the end of this year, which would be really kind of great. And, but can I get it now? Of course you can. Uh, so uh, unlike, uh, or like enough, a lot of stuff coming from Microsoft these days, this is fully open source. You can actually go grab the source for this and compile it right now. Um, everybody like C++? It's a great thing. Yeah. 
Wow, three of them. <laughs> you're gonna, it, it is a little bit of a challenge. You're gonna need Visual Studio 2019 or 2017. Uh, and you're going to need to pull it all out and then build it, and it takes a little bit. And, and I can even show you that if you're interested. I don't know if this is what you guys want to see. Um, but in the few weeks, it should make its appearance in the Windows Store, and you'll just be able to go and click and download it. And at some point in time in the future, I'm sure that they'll think about actually shipping it actually in the box, which would be really great. So, uh, feature watch, can we also extract split-screen That's a really good question. I don't think we're going to see that in 1.0. Sorry, oh, he's asking about split screen mode. I mean, it'll support things like, if you're attaching to a Linux console, obviously you can use screen and stuff like that inside of it, but for a native support of split screen mode inside of it itself, I don't think they're gonna have that in 1.0. Um, it's certainly something they could look at in the future. Um, definitely I request that on the, uh, on the GitHub site for, uh, for the console. There's already an issue for it? Yeah, it's like 200 issues people have filed in the first two days, I think. <laughs> Everybody runs out, oh, I want this, 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 this. And so now they're probably having to filter through out there. But yeah, it's a, I, I think that sort of thing would be great. Anything else people think that they should actually absolutely need? No? Sorry? Multi-threaded access to the console itself. I'm not sure what that means exactly. We're talking about two different, we're talking about two streams, right? I mean, the, the, the access to the console itself is, is a couple of streams. The application, the console app itself, definitely can be multi-threaded. There's nothing stopping that from happening. But I don't know that there's a lot that, without building things for it, maybe they should add a plugin model. That'd be really kind of neat, right? Add some plugins. No? Okay, so, moving along. Let's uh, talk about WSL2 for a moment. So, what was wrong with WSL? Um, it's actually an amazing product. I use it every single day. Um, but the file system perf wasn't quite where it needed to be. File system perf was a little, well, for certain operations, it was, it was, it was, it was really uh, suboptimal. Um, there are also a couple of architectural limitations that made certain scenarios very unlikely, like Docker and whatnot. There's just no way that they were going to be able to support that sort of thing directly in the way that they've designed WSL1. It, I mean, it's great, it was well done, it's an amazing feat of magic in my opinion, but there was just limitations on how that was going to work, and for them to actually have changed this in order to support those features was just not very likely. Um, there are a few other perf ideas they wanted to follow through up on, um, you know, in regards to how much memory it took or, or you know, how the processes worked and stuff like that, and so they thought, eh, we want to do all of these little things, but what are we going to spend our time on? And there's not a lot of developers working on this, it's a very, very small team, by the way. And so they thought, let's re-architect this a bit and come up with WSL2. And this does not mean that the current process model and the way that WSL works is going away. They just wanted to offer a different, uh, a different kind of experience along with this. And so what they've done is underneath, they've taken it apart and they said, no, 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 what we're going to do is we're going to build this containerized model where you basically got this Windows uh, or this Linux image ready to go and ready to run, and they can just start it up like that. Um, so it's a very, very quick startup. It has much better per instance memory. So if you've got like four instances of the same uh, of, of, the, of WSL and you want to run them, great, that works really awesome. The I.O. performance is amazing. It has totally changed things uh, for me in some ways. You can get in there, you can, you can, cl you can clone a repo and it feels as fast as it was on, on Linux to begin with. Uh, and then they've, they've had a whole different, because of the way this is in inside of a, cont a container now, it's no longer just a set of processes under Windows that it get basically access to the file system and they patch that through, they have to actually come up with a whole different way of being able to allow you to get access to the Windows file system from your Linux uh, apps and whatnot. And they've done that using a, a Plan 9 server, a Plan 9 file server, and uh, I think Rich Turner actually posted a nice document that describes that in you know, exceeding detail um, here uh, a few days ago. And I wholly recommend if you want to see how that works, go and look at it. Um, the downside with this, of course, is that means that A, this is... This little, Linux this little Linux world that you're seeing in there now is actually in a VHD, which means there's a, there's a disk image and it's got its, you know, an EX2 or EX, uh, EXT uh, for a file system in there and whatnot. Um, and so there is actually quite a bit of isolation. The Plan 9 file server back and forth allows access to these things, but it does mean that there is some changes to the way that things are going to uh, appear. All right, so let me go and find my... Let's go back here. And so just like... The regular uh, WSL2 or WSL, WSL2 can start, um, uh, it, it starts just very similar. Um, with the way that it's configured here, you can actually set a particular instance of Linux. Oh, it's not changing it over. That's great. There we go. Thank you. Cool. 
Um, so I'm going to start one of these. So WCL2, boom, here it comes up. And I've got an instance of this one running. Uh, it can be configured on a per instance of, of, of uh, Linux installation. So I've got one copy of, uh, of, of Ubuntu running as WSL2 and one running as the original WSL1. Uh, and so let's do a, oh, let's find out something here. Um, well, let's just run it from hand. Time, get clone. Auto rest. So we'll see how fast. I don't know if you guys have seen how the, how long this sort of stuff takes before, but we'll do this one here and tell you what. Let's go and do this over here too. Azure Auto rest. Now this repo isn't all that large. Um, well, okay, it's a little bit big. Uh, so it takes about 26 seconds over there, uh, of which, actually, that's surprisingly high. Well, let's see how long this one takes. Um, right, so the, the file system performance, as we'll see here, we're going to see quite a bit of difference between the two, uh, the speed of the, the WSL1 versus the WSL2. And, well, that's playing around. Let me go find my other window, which is not that one. Is it that one? Yeah, come on. Nope, that's not it. It's got to be this one. There we go. Sorry, there we go. The other thing we can do is play with things like Docker. So that's something you could definitely not do under under WSL before. I just got I just installed Docker right off the uh, uh, right from the package. Works like a charm, um, which is quite amazing actually. Oh, sorry, my apologies. Yeah, you gotta kill me once in a while. See, Docker running right inside that little light, uh, inside that lightweight container. So that works really well. Um, and that's, again, changing my life in a lot of ways. Let's go back and see what our file system performs here. Right, so <laughs> 44 seconds in WSL1 to clone that repo, uh, of which 11 of it was user time and 20 of it was system time, according to this. And on WSL2, you know, the change is, is quite radical. Uh, I have some other, other apps that are very, very, very file system uh, dependent, and I'm seeing, like, you know, 15 to 1 difference in, 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 the, in the amount of time things are taking to do the operation. So I'm very happy with it. Uh, really, I, and, and past that, there's not a lot of, you know, it doesn't feel like there's an awful lot of changes. It is really snappy. It sure feels like you're, you're, you're oops, that's it. Uh, it is snappy. It, it, it feels super fast. It feels very responsive. Um, I'm using it already. It's, it'll, be, uh, it'll be coming out pretty quick. Um, of course, you can run PowerShell in it and it works just fine. Come on. Yeah. How, how does it change the network? Oh, right. This is <laughs> the downsides. Okay. So, yeah, the, the, right now, the version that's uh, available or the version that is going to be available for, fairly soon, it does have a couple of downsides. Let me switch back to my deck here because I do have some slides on this sort of thing. Ooh. And I'm, oh no, sorry. Um, so the downsides are, yeah, right now the networking is, is isolated because it's working in an actual virtual machine. They have to implement a new networking pipeline so that they can basically provide a virtual adapter inside of that that will get mapped back into the host correctly. Is this it? Yeah. Right, so they're looking to have this actually hit the, uh, the insider's channel and the Windows uh, Windows Insider channel sometime in the next month or so, I've been told. Um, and the limitations are there's some stabilization work. The virtualized IP, uh, the VM's uh, IP address is currently separate from the host, and you can actually see that when you're inside of it right now. It's obviously a container, and you get a different IP address, uh, and it's managed separately. Um, but yeah, they do want to make it so that that can be presented back on the host just naturally, which to me would be a huge win, um, but it is one of the most difficult pieces that they have to work on. Uh, and then they've got some other host container file system perf work because the now accessing the Windows file system from Linux is is quite a big hit uh, over what it was just because it's basically talking over, you know, technically it's talking over TCP IP. Will you be able to use network scanning tools? I would think so. I haven't been confirmed on that. The uh, 
I would imagine because of virtual, I mean, right now you should be able to because it'll run in a VM. And I think the only difference that you're going to see there is that those things might be mapped, like the, 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 the thing will be mapped back into the host uh, directly rather than, rather than getting its own IP stack normally. And I know that that doesn't, shouldn't interfere with that, but I would, I would hope, I would definitely expect to at this point just because the VM is, is exposed, or it's, it's able to handle st stuff like that a lot better. Because it's not a, you know, they didn't have to basically interrupt the networking stack at a, at a very high level. This one is going to be down below and you won't even know it. Like Linux, the rest of Linux shouldn't even understand it. Uh, any other questions on, on how this works and whatnot? Uh, Linux, sorry, uh, so I'm trying to think about how to say it. He wants to know about the performance difference between being in a container in Docker and in, uh, in, in the VM in, in here. I, I would think there would be very little difference, but I don't think anybody's benchmarked that sort of thing yet. Um, just trying to think. Why does it support which? Well, so the reason they want to support, the reason they're going to end up supporting two technologies, because an awful lot of developers took a, an interest in way that WSL was working and, you know, vested, said, I'm using this for this stuff daily. Um, and I think that currently they're worried about the, the file system performance to go back to Windows. So when you want to have both Windows and Linux stuff in the same, you know, or to be able to access the file system transparently there, I think that they're worried about the, the eventual, you know, how much performance they can actually squeeze back out to be able to get back to that. Um, I suspect that in the very, very long run, they might say, well, this thing, we get it to the, you know, get to the right spot where, you know, everything works much better on WSL2, and they might do that. At this point in time, they're saying, don't worry, we're not going to take it away. It will re definitely require the Hyper-V extension. Oh, sorry, he's asking whether it uses, um, whether he can use other virtualization software you know, whether it ha is going to be required to be just like Hyper-V or whatever uh, versus another virtualization software. And the answer is yes, it will be a, it uses Hyper-V underneath for its containers, so there's no way of getting around that. So VirtualBox and WSL2 at the same time would not be possible, whereas with WSL1, ah, this thing's falling off. With WSL1, uh, it's not going to have that problem because it's not actually a VM, right? So that's probably another reason. Uh, it is basically a Linux container in a window, yes. I mean, the, 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 he's saying that it looks just like being on a Windows container or in a Linux container, and that's essentially what it is, yes. The, it's, it's, essentially, it's a containerized version of Linux that we're able to access and, and, and has much better access into it than, say, um, a, well, a, a traditional VM for certain. Anything, okay, moving along. So how to get involved. So when you, if you're looking to see more about the way that the Windows Terminal stuff comes out and get actual access to that, you can go to the, the, the Terminal GitHub site right now. Um, you can you can actually say install and run Windows Terminal. You have to build it first in order to install it. Um, but you can kick the tires. You can file bugs and share feedback and, 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 and get involved in the process of actually uh, saying what you want out of it or what you think you'd like to see. For developers, you can clone the repo. There it is. The repo uh, is a GitHub Microsoft Terminal. Um, go ahead and grab it, run it. You're going to need Visual Studio, like I said, to get, the, to get into that. Um, and it does take a little bit of effort to build. If you want, I can actually show you how to do that. It's not very, I got that set up on this machine. Um, and then for the actual contacts, you can talk to the team responsible for this stuff, which is Rich Turner, uh, Michael Nixa, and uh, Kayla Cinnamon. They are the actual people who are managing this stuff, and they are more than welcome to take your, uh, your feedback. Um, Rich said an awful lot of people uh, <laughs> came out of the woodwork right after build, so he was uh, really, really kind of busy. Um, and then what else do we have here? Oh, the slides and the demo code. So I don't have any actual demo code that I can share you, uh, other than the fact that I can show you the, the actual stuff there. But if I did, it'd be up on that. And so I can open the rest of it up for more questions. Um, back to the terminal. You, you mentioned remoting. Mm -hmm. So well, they they, <laughs> they haven't actually come out and said how they're going to make that work. But because they're working on a virtual, they're oh, he wants to talk about remoting. So I, who wants to know how the remoting works with the virtual terminal? Yeah. 
So with Terminal, they will have the ability to, because they've already started to abstract the, the, the PTY from the, the actual front end, um, the communication between those two pieces can be over anything. So they can do that remotely to another machine. Um, that is a piece that they're working on for 1.0, but I don't believe they've actually started the coding on that yet, or I haven't seen it though. At this point, so he asked whether the Windows terminal will be available on other channels, not through the Microsoft Store. Um, I would not think so. I think that it's the way that the uh, application is architected. If you want to get it somewhere else, you'd have to actually build it because it requires the, the it's, it's, it's basically a, um, a UWP app with a bunch of other background stuff in there. And the way that we have for distributing that stuff is through there. It would be possible for someone to build one and, and host it themselves to do that if that, was, if that was necessary, but I think that the official channel is going to be the way that they can expect to see it come out. Yes? Oh, yes, absolutely. So, okay, let me show you how this thing can be built. Oh, open console, here we go. So I went and, well, oh, not show me that. There we go. Okay, so I actually went and built this. So you can clone the repo on uh, from GitHub. And basically, you open it up in Visual Studio. Now, there's two things which you're going to have to do, which always drives me crazy, is the first time you open it in Visual Studio, it if you miss, it, on, the, on, the, on the GitHub site, they'll tell you all the things you need to make sure you installed. And in Visual Studio 2019, if you didn't install them all, it'll remind you that you need to do that, and it'll click a button, and it'll take you back to the installer and have it installed. That's really handy, because when you try to do this in 2017, it doesn't tell you that. So that was the number one thing. The second thing is, is that it will come up, and for some unknown reason, Visual Studio defaults the what, uh, what build you want to build with, as uh, it sorts this list alphabetically, and ARM64 <laughs> comes before X64, and X64, if you're running on 64-bit Windows, you must build the 64-bit Windows version, you can't run the 32-bit version, because they're also building the con host um, executable as well in here, and that stuff it goes pretty damn low level. So make sure that you're running x64, uh, and then all you have to do is, you know, you can build this thing, and it will, uh, see, and I already had it all built, so let's just rebuild it. Come on. Rebuild. And so there are quite a few different components here. And what they've done is they've actually split this thing up into several different pieces that can be independently worked on and, and, and serviced and whatnot. And so the actual console host executable, the one where they fixed all these things and, and whatnot, that source code is in here. This is actually a big chunk of the Windows source code that, that made it into the real world. Um, and then they've got, their, they, they've got their thing for building the actual control for the, for the terminal, and then they've got the app itself and all these other pieces that kind of go together. And so you can actually bring it up here, run it, and debug it. It, uh, it does take a little bit of effort to compile this thing, or a little bit of time to compile it. Oh, there it goes. Nope, still going. All right. Oh, no. <laughs> my, my. No, it, on, he wants to know whether it will compile on Visual Studio 2010, and the answer is no. It will, you can get it to compile on Visual Studio 20. Uh, 17 or 2019, and you need like the very latest um, S Win 10 SDK, there is no way in the world that's going to compile back. You know, A, it's not going to go on the back plot. It's not going to be able to compile without the, uh, the very latest version of the SDK. They're taking an awful lot of dependencies on some of the, some of the really new technologies. I've been told that it does not interfere with that at all. He wants to know whether how the Visual Studio or how the WSL uh, runs with the containers for the rest of the system. It is isolated from everything else on its own. It's not, doesn't con it doesn't even require Docker to be installed, the, the Docker tool set to be installed. It uses the, the, the containers on Windows support built into Windows 10. Um, and it is completely and totally separate. You don't, even, you don't see it show up in Hyper-V, you don't see it show up in the other container stuff, so it's basically completely isolated. They're using the APIs to use that sort of stuff. And then on top of that, they've got a, uh, they, they take the Windows or the Linux image and they basically preload all that stuff and then it basically just 
blast it to memory when you start one up, change a couple of variables, and off it starts. That's why it's also got a very good uptime, because if they're, they've got the, the memory image of that, that container ready to go. Oh, still compiling, holy cow. <laughs> it, is a, it is a bit of a process. Oh, there it goes. Nope. Holy cow. Oh, and you know what? If I don't close my Windows, my, my, uh, my instance of this, it's going to stop and yell at me anyway. Bam, 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 bam. Is there any other questions that you guys want to see or anything else you want me to show in the, con in the, in the terminal? I mean, it's kind of a, you know, it's a terminal, yay! <laughs> but it is, uh, it's, very, it's, very, it's getting very nice to use. I think that you're going to find, if you go and build this right now, you're going to find a couple of little things that are, you know, it's like, hey, that doesn't work so well. Um, but that's why it's a work in progress, and they decided to share it as soon as they could possibly give something out to the, the whole community. Is it really finished? Oh, my goodness. I don't think so. He wants to know whether it's possible to communicate. Sorry? So he's asking about whether you can run things in one in one tab and then have it communicate with other things going on there. I mean, it's just as if it was the the things in the different tabs are basically just going to be the the same execute or the as if they're running on the same OS. So there's nothing in in terminal that's going to enable that any better. Um, if you have if you're running, so if I go well, let's wait till it's finished compiling. Um, so if I go and run WSL in one tab, and I go and I run the same instance of WSL elsewhere, it's talking to the same instance of container, which is probably not what you're asking about. Um, but there's no additional support. It's just basically like having multiple windows, except it's the, it, the UI is all unified in there. So there's nothing magical about that. Holy cow, this thing's still going. You don't want to do this every day. Is it running? Come on. And come on, it's almost there. I tell you, it's been a while since I've done some C++ myself. I come and started working with this, and I'm like, oh my god. And there's a lot of interesting constructs they use these days in C++. And it's still going. Come on, it's just about done. Hmm. Question about WSL2. Yes. Absolutely. He wants to know whether about the, they, they have the same distribution support. Absolutely. As a matter of fact, you can. The way you actually use this right now is is you can go and install a distribution just as if it was just normally, and then you can just tell it to convert it to a WSL2 instance, and it'll turn around, take that stuff, toss it in the uh, in a VHC, and when you start it up, it's just the same. It's it's actually pretty darn cool. I was really amazed they could do that, and you can actually switch it back and forth. Now it takes a bit of time because basically it's going to move the whole file system in and out of a VHD when it's doing that, but it works great. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, still going. Holy cow! In WSL one. That was the only reason. Um, th this certainly does solve the. Perf he wants to know about the the performance on Ruby on Rails was uh, how well that works with uh, with WSL too. Um, I, I imagine that it's been been resolved with that stuff, especially if it's inside the image. Um, typically, I would expect that Rails doesn't need to use an offload. Like you're not looking to share files the Windows uh, off the Windows partition. So I would assume that that should solve the problem fairly quickly with uh, with Rails work. Um, I'm going, holy cow, it finished. That only took, what, five minutes? And so from there, you can hit, oh, ho, ho. no. Oh, I have to deploy it. Why did I, I should have done that automatically. Deploy, deploy. Yeah, so this is a Windows uh, UWP app, which means that you basically have to tell it to go and put itself in the right spot before it actually wants to run it. Uh, and it will even stick a nice little copy of itself in the, hey, that's weird. Why does it look different? 
terminal. Okay, so it does do that. Okay. And it's still doing the deploy. Wow, that's real snappy. As soon as that's done, we can run it again. Yes? Will it support drag and drop between the different... So you want to be able to take a tab off of one and drop it into another? The full path? I imagine, yes, it would. There's absolutely no reason not to support that. Um, it is being a Windows uh, being a Windows app itself. You can drag stuff into it. I was playing around with the dragging things. I started playing around with actually dragging a tab in and out of it because I was playing with something else, and it to totally supports that from a UI perspective. So that is certainly uh, a possibility. Okay, so now, now we can run it, right? Now you can run it. Yes. Pops up the debugger. So now I'm running it under the debugger. And yeah, there's a few little interesting things with the way that works. But yeah, it works just fine here. <laughs> yes? Are the instructions on how to build it and compile it on GitHub itself? Yes, we can go take a quick um, gander at how that looks. Microsoft Terminal. Terminal. Absolutely. So you go down here and it will tell you what you need to do. How do I do this? There are no binaries, yada, yada, yada. Um, basically, you just put it all, you, you, you make sure you have the, the Visual Studio and all the right pieces installed. You go into the environment and hit Control Shift B and it'll build it. Um, there, you don't have to do any weird stuff to make it actually compile or anything like that. So, that is fine. <coughs> yes? Uh, is it possible to uh, to start a new process from one tab and ask it to elevate so that you can start it in a new tab? I don't know. I actually have no idea. I don't think so at this point in time. Um, So yeah, so that, that required, you're saying that it required it, the, the, whole, the whole console itself to be elevated. Yeah, that'd be my guess at this point in time. I would expect that you should be able to, they should be able to, oh, that's a hard one to say because the communication between the con host that has to be elevated to talk to the elevated shell process would be tricky to not have it require the, 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 the terminal itself be elevated. That's something we'd probably have to ask uh, the, 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 the people on the WSL team directly. Um, yeah, because I, I honestly have no idea where that one's headed. Anything else anybody wants to know? WSL, terminal, see it compile again? <laughs> no? All righty. Let me, uh, I think that was the end of my stuff anyway. Holy cow. And then he hits F5. No. Get back to that one at the bottom. There we go. Yay. So thanks for coming, everybody. There you go. There you go.